Good evening and welcome. I'm Ann Walters Robertson, Dean of the Division of the Humanities at the University of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Fall Dean Salon. The Humanities Division offers an annual series of Dean Salons to highlight the work of our distinguished faculty through the study and practice of the arts, language, literature, music, philosophy, and more, the Humanities Division explores the ideas that shape and define us. This exploration is how we make the world and ourselves ready for change and build a better future. I'm thrilled all of you have joined us to hear our speakers, Alan Sanderson and Kenneth Warren, to tell us about the 2008 financial crisis and how literature can help us understand its significance. Alan Sanderson is a senior instructional professor in economics at the University of Chicago. Alan joined UChicago from Princeton in 1984 served eight years as associate provost of the university and has also been senior research science at the National Opinion Research Center. Alan teaches a very popular two quarter sequence on the principles of microeconomics and macroeconomics. He also teaches a course and does research on the economics of sports. He has received the very prestigious Quantrell Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching and also has the distinction of having taught more undergraduate students at UChicago than anyone in the history of the university. Allen has also run the Chicago Marathon three times. Kenneth Warren is the Fairfax M. Cohn Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of English. Ken's scholarship and teaching focus on American and African-American literature from the late 19th century through the middle of the 20th century. He is particularly interested in the way that debates about literary form and genre are related to political and social change. Ken is the author of three books. What was African-American literature from 2010? So Black and Blue, Ralph Ellison and the Occasion of Criticism from 2003, and Black and White Strangers, Race and American Literary Realism from 1993. He's also the co-editor of Renewing Black Intellectual History, The Material and Ideological Foundations of African American Thought from 2010, and Jim Crow, Literature and the Legacy of Sutton E. Griggs from 2013. Ken joined the University of Chicago in 1991. Alan and Ken will tell us today about the 2008 financial crisis and its representation in literature. Their conversation will illuminate the relationship between the novel and society, and I'm keen to hear what they have to say. Now, throughout tonight's discussion, we want to hear from you, and we look forward to your thoughts and questions. Please feel free to add your comments throughout the discussion using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for questions following Alan's and Ken's discussion, and I know they're eager to hear what you have on your minds. And now I'm excited to turn the virtual podium over to Alan and Ken for this evening's conversation. Alan, I believe, will kick off the conversation by telling us in more detail about the economics of the 2008 crisis. Thank you, Dean Robertson, or normally, Anne. Uh, pleasure to, to join your group. And also, uh, thanks to, to Ken Warren. Uh, a good friend and colleague on campus. It's not often that somebody from economics and somebody from English can actually consider themselves friends, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try it out tonight and see how it goes. Good evening, and Dean Robertson as well. I'm, I'm excited to be here to discuss this topic uh, with, with Alan. Um, and uh, you know, I uh, share the uh, 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 same sentiments that Alan has just expressed. It's been a, a wonderful conversation over a number of years. So uh, let me start or kick off this conversation. Uh, if it gets too long, please uh, nudge me. Uh, 
off the stage. Um, back in late 2009, uh, the University of Chicago Magazine approached me and uh, proposed a, a project. And uh, it was their theme, and I give them credit for it, was to take the NCAA basketball March Madness format that starts off with 64 teams and whittles down to who in the end is the best college basketball team in the country and say, what if we thought about what caused the 2008 recession? And in the same way, we started with them with 16 teams, and in this case, not basketball teams, but uh, 16 reasons or factors. And we started at 16, it was a manageable number, and uh, tried to whittle it down to not, which is the best basketball team, college basketball team in the country, but which is in some ways the biggest center in the congregation that caused or had the most responsibility for what happened during 2008 and 10. Uh, the American Economic Association, which has, we have our annual meeting in January, uh, found out about this and approached me and approached the, the magazine to get permission to see if they could run the same kind of tournament. They would just take our data and allow professional economists and usually academic economists uh, it was inserted in the program that was held in Atlanta that year. Uh, and professional economists could vote on what they thought. Where the NCAA uses regional brackets, what I created was to say, what if we thought about brackets in other ways? One of them, Washington, D.C. bracket, meaning could be the Bush administration, uh, could be the Fed, uh, could be even thinking abroad, maybe this uh, was an international global crisis. Some have labeled it as such um, or uh, anything else. Then one other bracket was Wall Street. So thinking about a team we called the moral hazards, what I did was pick the 16 teams and write little 50 word descriptions about the team, uh, largely sarcastically. Uh, but um, to what extent were bailouts the issue or an important issue? Or feed, what I call the feeding frenzies, which is really the, the media. Um, I've come over the last couple of years to dislike the media and not right wing or left wing, but both uh, for what I consider just irresponsible journalism in the reporting of what's happened in COVID uh, over the last couple of years uh, on the economic front. Um, another team or one of the other teams that, uh, that I gave a name to, which ended up being votes among uh, professional economists as what they felt was the most important factor in the 2008 financial crisis. And the team name was Moral Hazards. Moral hazard is an economic term that applies to any number of situations. It just says, is there, and, and related terms become asymmetric information or principal agent problems. Back in uh, 2013, uh, Marissa Mayer, who was the uh, CEO of Yahoo, sent a memo to Yahoo employees saying, from now on, you all and this is again way pre-COVID, you all have to return to the office to work. So get out of your pajamas and you have to come, you have to report sort of how un-Californian can, can that be? Um, and what she was trying to prevent, and I think it's a, an interesting issue and, and nobody's really brought it up in, in the COVID era, uh, is that the the principal here or the boss or the CEO or whatever you want to call her or him. Uh, when you're in the office, there's a little more chance to observe what you're doing and your, your productivity. Uh, when you're home in the kitchen, uh, there's less as to are you really working very hard and or harder than you in the office or are you filling out your fantasy football team or playing with a cat? Um, 
and it causes moral hazard problems. And firms go to a fair amount of length to try to reduce moral hazard problems. Uh, it is clearly an issue with workers at home. And what's going to be is we allow them to come back into, into the office. Okay. The, the second uh, branch, the Washington, D.C., was the Federal Reserve System or the Fed or the team, I call them the yo-yos, uh, for up and down movements in interest rates that uh, can affect a number of sectors and certainly the housing sector in, in particular. Um, so uh, also with concern about the Fed at the moment of uh, Chairman Powell, whose term is up in a couple months, uh, but also how has the Fed's action in accommodating the president's uh, spending policies and basically printing money uh, and monetizing the debt, how does that factor in? Um, I think of this in spite of the fact that some information went out and, and uh, some global crises happened in other countries like Greece, which doesn't matter a whole lot, uh, or Iceland, which matters a little bit more, uh, where there were serious financial problems uh, during this period. Uh, the third region called Wall Street, uh, and uh, there were part moral hazard come into to play again. Also bailouts. And that's not unrelated to moral hazard. And that if I know that somebody is going to bail me out, whether it's on this loan uh, for a car or if it's a mortgage on a house, um, how does that affect my, my behavior? The uh, last uh, team in the Wall Street uh, area uh, as I said before, I call feeding frenzies it's just how has the uh, how has the media uh, profited? How did they in 2008? How have they in 2020, 2021 from bad news? Uh, the old TV news slogan is always if it bleeds, it leads, which means there's going to be some death or car crash or murder or something like that will be the lead story. Uh, bad news sells commercial time. Bad news sells newspapers. Uh, but it uh, also help, hurts in other areas. Um, the, the final team there, I call the foreclosures, uh, which just means the housing in, industry. Uh, the foreclosures was neck and neck uh, with, by professional economists as to what they thought was the serious problem um, with, with the, the financial sector. And it's more complicated than one might think. It's not just that somebody got in over their head uh, on, on a loan, but in fact, people acting very much in the same way. Uh, economists believe that people respond predictably to incentives. What was the bank's incentive to make a loan that it knew the uh, borrower couldn't repay? What was the incentive on the part of the borrower, especially, say, in the bottom half of the income distribution? Sure, we're not going to be able to pay off this loan eventually, but as long as the house is increasing by 20% a year, what do we care? Uh, and it uh, conjured up some notions of what we're called ninja loans, where ninja stood for no income, job, or assets, uh, that there was an incentive on the part of banks to make the loans. Uh, even if they had to foreclose on the property, it was going to be worth more than the outstanding loan. Uh, may well be the homeowner who's had his or her house or their house uh, foreclosed on uh, still uh, was came out of it in not bad shape because of the increased value. Um, also, if they knew that the Fed or the Treasury would bail them out, again, everybody has an incentive to get rich uh, on the system. And it's not just the, the perennial businessman or fat cat, but all the way th through the economy uh, in, in this regard. Um, the only constraint that the... Uh, magazine put on me was that one of the 16 teams 
had to be the University of Chicago Department of Economics as one of the 16 most responsible for this. And I'd be glad to, uh, to chat about that a little later as, uh, as we go through. We also had a counterweight. Uh, we called them the hurricanes from uh, Keynesian economics and irrational behavior and animal spirits and, and so forth. Uh, finally, another team we called the watchdogs. These are the credit agencies, Standard, Poor, Fitches. Um, I do, as Ann said, a lot of work on sports economics. Uh, I'm always skeptical, whether it's in sports economics or related economic impact studies, when somebody pays some firm $100,000 to give their estimate of their economic impact on the city or on the state or whatever. Once you pay somebody a hundred thousand uh, dollars to, to produce some economic impact study, there's a inherent bias in producing something that, you know, the client is going to be happy with. And uh, I think in, in terms of the watchdogs, uh, they were being paid to say that the, uh, these other institutions were just fine, nothing wrong with them. And uh, that didn't help us uh, at all uh, with this. So, um, anyway, uh, why don't I uh, sort of stop there and, and, and let Ken uh, respond or, or, or introduce his more literature material. Okay. Um, always a pleasure, as I said, to engage uh, with Alan. Um, um, and uh, I've learned a lot from our conversations over the year. Uh, I, Alan's, as Alan recalls, four or five years ago, I think it was um, when I was teaching a course on the novel and the Gilded Age, uh, Alan, along with my colleague and English professor, Elaine Hadley, who was concurrently teaching a course on liberalism in the novel, jointly convened our classes for a viewing of the, and discussion of the 2006 um, uh, a Gabriel um, Chino film, The Pursuit of Happiness, starring Will Smith. Right. And I thought the discussion you know, highlighted some disciplinary and personal little similarities and dissimilarities, which I hope we, we can explore further this evening. So um, uh, on the assumption that we'll pick up the questions and respond to each other, I'll just dive into my remarks. So rather than begin with an overview of the way in which questions about novels and questions about finance or the financial crisis intertwine, I'll start by taking us directly into a novel that makes its interest in financial matters quite clear from the outset. And this is a novel that I've taught in the course that I uh, have done on the financial crisis. And that novel is John Lanchester's Capital, which is published in uh, uh, 2012, but uh, set in, the, in London in 2007, so just prior to the crash. And I'll say at the outset, my description here will not do the novel uh, justice. Its stories are too numerous for me to sum them up here, um, which is to say it's episodic, comprising a set of characters for, for whom the only essential connection is they, that they occupy houses on a street called Peeps Road, most of which were built by a property developer in the late 19th century during a boom that followed the abolition on tax and bricks, brick and were targeted at lower middle-class families who were willing to live in an unfashionable part of town, I'm quoting from the novel here, in return for the chance to own a terraced house, a house large enough to have a room for servants. But at some point, we're told very quickly, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, Peeps Road begins to climb up the economic ladder, um, shedding its mid-20th mid century denizens who are described as the respectable, aspirational, no longer poor. And so that by the time Lanchester's story commences in 2007, uh, the road and its habitants have changed in some ways quite markedly. The working class populace has given way first to a middle class popula uh, population, and then ultimately to people possessing the financial wherewithal to embark on major renovations. And I take that's probably an experience that is common to many of us. Uh, the narrator tells us by late 2007, uh, after more than a, uh, more, uh, many more years of a new boom, it was usual for two or three houses on the street to be undergoing some sort of major renovation at the same time. The fashion was for people to install basements at a cost usually starting around 100,000 pounds um, a time but as more than one of the people digging out the foundations of their house like to point out, although the basements cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, they also added at least that much to the value of the house. So look at that from a certain point of view. 
And because many of the new residents worked in the city of London, this was a popular point of view. The basement conversions um, were free. And so you're, you see, I'm talking about one set of uh, one region, I think, in, uh, in, in Alan's um, 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 March Madness scenario here. And I'm going to read some more from the novel because Lanchester at the outset, he's just not at all shy. He's a novelist who tells the reader what he's about. And since he does it quite well, I don't see any reason to paraphrase. I'll perhaps alight a little bit. And he continues, he says, all this was a part of a big change in the nature of Peeps Road. Over its history, almost everything that could have happened in the street had happened. Many, many people had fallen in love and out of love. A young girl had had her first kiss. An old man had exhaled, exhaled his last breath. A solicitor on his way back from the underground station after work had looked up at the sky, swept blue by the wind, and had a sudden sense of religious consolation, a feeling that his life cannot that this life cannot possibly be all, and that it is not possible for consciousness to end with the end of life. Babies had died of diphtheria, and people had shot up heroin in bathrooms, and young mothers had cried their overwhelming sense of fatigue and isolation, and people had planned to escape and scheme for their big break and veg down in front of televisions and set fire to their kitchens by forgetting to turn the chip pan off and fallen off ladders and experienced everything that can happen in the run of life, birth and death and love and hate and happiness and sadness and complex feeling and every shade of emotion in between. So I'll pause here to note that in cataloging all that has happened on Peeps Road, Cap the narrator of, of Capital has, with each clause, given us a story that could have been a novel in its own right. As if to indicate, for most of the history of Peeps, Peeps Road, to narrate its story in its totality would require a project on the order of Honoré de Balzac's La Comédie Humaine, a project that took what, some 15 uh, years or so to complete. In contrast, the narration of the present moment, which is to say 2007, has to contend with what the narrator describes as an astonishing plot twist on the residents of Peep Peeps Road. He continues, for the first time in history, the people who lived in the street were by global and, my, and maybe even by local standards, rich. The thing that had made them rich was the very fact that they lived in Peeps Road. They were rich simply because of that, because all of the houses in Peeps Road, as if by magic, were now worth millions of pounds. He goes on, this caused a strange reversal. For most of its history, the street lived in by more, the street was lived in by more or less the kind of people it was built for. The aspiring, not too well off. They were happy to live there, and living there was part of a busy and determined attempt to do better, to make a good life for themselves and their families. But the houses were the backdrop to their lives. They were an important part of life but they were a set where events took place rather than the principal characters. Now, however, the houses had become so valuable to people who already lived in them and so expensive for people who had recently moved into them that they became central characters, central actors in their own right. So although Lanchester's narrator calls this strange reversal an astonishing plot twist, it's actually more profound than that. It's, an ontological reversal. Entities that are things or objects or places have now become agents, which is to say actors in their own right. No longer the result of other actions, they themselves cause actions. And as they do so, the people in them, who in previous decades would have been the reasons for the story of, that the novel is about to tell, are now almost nothing more than a, an effect of their story, of the story of their houses. Or as I'll make clearer momentarily, they are almost no more than an effect of the story of the prices of their houses. A distinction that at once matters a great deal and in some ways not at all. This reversal is so thorough that when Lanchester's narrator gives us an overview of the conversations among the inhabitants, which is to say an overview of how they exist socially, we learn that it began to be all right for people to talk about house prices all the time. 
The topic came up in conversation with, within the first minute of people speaking to each other. When people met, they held off the subject of house prices with a conscious sense of restraint and gave in to the desire to talk about them with relief. It is as if the entire domain of sociality has been reduced to talk about prices. Now to understand how significant this reversal is from the standpoint of, no of novels or the history of the novel, consider that for more than one historian of the novel, the great discovery of that genre in the mid to late 19th century was the entity of society, which is to say the beginning of an understanding that society was the fully secularized production of individual human beings interacting across time in a symphonic relation with a corporate whole constituted by other differently situated individuals and groups inflected by occupation, belief, temperament, family obligations, traditions, and the like. Now, importantly for our purposes this evening, the ascendancy of the English novel in the mid 19th century occurred along with but also in opposition to the rise of modern economic thinking. In a very important book on the English novel, Elizabeth Ehrmarth notes that where once individuals in the novelist who chronicle so social life could look to nature as the source of and the guarantor, guarantor of the meaning of human life, Darwinism had put paid to that. So that the more nature, and this is a quote on the, um, on the screen there, um, after Darwin comes to look like a battleground, the more society becomes the primary context for human life and even a protection from nature. Social and historical novels develop a vision of the social entity conspicuously different from the economic system developed from Adam Smith and pilloried in fictional capitalists like uh, uh, Charles Dickens's Mr. Myrtle from um, um, uh, Little Dorrit and Anthony Trollope's Melmot from The Way We Live Now. The grammar of perspective in social novels by definition includes everything in its human discourse, including economy and the market. So all this is to say that society for the great novels of the 19th century comprehends, but it is not produced by the law of laws of economics. Erbach remarks that um, Adam Smith's social order produces and what that order produces is wealth. Anything that does not produce wealth does not belong to, the social to that social entity, except parasitically. By contrast, she argues, social novels focus on precisely what Smith leaves out. In historical and social narrative, society is not primarily a mechanism for growing and harvesting cash. So, Lanchester's fascinating insight then, just from the standpoint of this long history of the novel, is that for the post-2008 novel, economics has entirely turned the tables. Society has become nothing but a conversation about harvesting cash, and that this harvesting happens through the ownership of homes makes the transformation all the more fascinating. If the 19th century novel tracks the movement of individuals between homes, across homes through them, the post-crash novel, Lanchester suggests, or the post-recession novel, whatever you wanna call it, tracks only the movement of prices and what price is and what the million pounds price tags attached to these homes reflect is not primarily the changes to the physical structures produced by renovations, although these renovations do play a role, play a role, but rather the presumption, the certainty, possibility, that there always exists some person somewhere with the wherewithal and the desire to buy the value of that house or the value that the house represents. What Lanchester's novel is about, what sociality has become is the market. And what the market requires minimally is that someone owns the right to sell and someone else has the need or the obligation to buy. And seen in this way, a house, however comfortable, is not primarily a location, the place where you eat with your family, sleep, make love, watch television or whatever, but something whose having is inevitably and more powerfully than ever entwined with someone else wanting it. 
And to this, to the extent that this novel has a plot that conjoins its human entities, it's created by the mysterious appearance at various moments of cards at each of the homes, featuring on one side a photograph of the front of the house, and on the other, printed in black ink, the words, we want what you have. Um, it is only um, um, this event that puts, uh, the, the, it's only, excuse me, the events put into motion by these cards that bring most of the characters in this novel finally into something like direct interaction with another. I mean, throughout, we see what's going on in the, in the uh, neighborhood, um, but the um, inhabitants don't really know what's going on with their neighbors. What brings these people together um, is that the words, we want what you have, carry, with them, carry within them a threat of socioeconomic up upheaval. But as one of the residents of Peeps Road also notes, they also express the very sentiment that gives these homes value in the first place. Wanting a home or wanting a right to sell a home at its price significantly higher than one paid for it became an inevitable feature of the social imagination in relatively, uh, the relatively wealthy West of the world in significant part because of what was happening in the decades prior to the crash of 2008, which is namely the relative growth or lack thereof of household per capita income um, in the de decade preceding the crisis. In a 2018 assessment of what had and had not happened since the crisis, Lanchester, who's in addition to being a novel, he does write a lot about financial novelist. He writes a lot about financial issues as well. He offered the following graph from Branko Milanovic uh, to illustrate how the financial crisis was not the same for all who were touched by it. Uh, by showing the differing positions of different groups from around the world in terms of income. Now, Lanchester glosses Milanovic's graph in the following way. So most of the people uh, between points um, A and B, the high point, and uh, B, the low point, are the working middle and middle classes of the developed world. Um, in other words, the global poor, if you start with the, uh, to the left of the graph, these are the people who are the poorest, um, um, have been consistently getting better off over the last uh, decades up through the, uh, the highest rate of growth uh, at, at, at point A. Um, whereas the previous global middle class, most of whom are in the developed world, have seen relative decline. And those are the people between A and uh, B. And of course, the elite at the top half have uh, been doing better than ever. According to Milanovic then, the people at point B, right at the bottom, um, at the uh, 80th uh, um, uh, percentile there, although richer than those at point A, sit at zero on this graph, indicating the absence of any growth in income over 20 years. These people, these people are almost all from the rich economies of the um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. One could say that for these people, the idea of buying a home from savings derived from income growth would, during that decade, would have been impossibility, which would, as Lanchester's novel suggests, indicate that social dynamism during this period derived from owning a home, or as many an unfortunate, or you might say careless or um, 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 morally problematic mortgage holder found out from being owned by one. And so let me uh, stop there and invite uh, Dean uh, Robertson to uh, um, uh, join us for uh, a conversation, I guess, between the two of us and then uh, a conversation with all of you as well. Well, thank you so much, Ken and Alan, uh, for that most thought-provoking uh, dis discussion. Uh, I know I learned a great deal, and not only about the 2008 crisis, but also about the history of the novel and how the genre has evolved in light of social and economic change. Now, we're very, very eager for your questions, so please don't be shy. Go ahead and start typing and send them to us using the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. And um, we'll start with, uh, with this one. Um, how does the literature of this 
2008 financial crisis compare with prior major economic dislocations like the depression of the 1930s? And are businessmen or the rich assigned roles as villains with responsibility for the generated hardships? Okay, yeah, that's that's a really good uh, really good question, um, and and the answer varies um, over the century or more of the history of the novel that we're that we're talking about. As Ermark indicates, in the novels of the mid nineteenth century, with the rise of the millionaire, um, um, many of those uh, individuals are not treated uh, with a great deal of uh, uh, respect. They're treated as kind of humbugs. Um, and as the problem for society and not the solution of society. So uh, Mr. Myrtle is clearly a villain in, in the novel, Little Dorrit. Over the latter part of the 19th century, as realism takes flight, particularly in the US, novelists find themselves trying to keep abreast of the dramatic social change, um, which is marked by the rise, this is the Gilded Age, a rise of of um, an extraordinary number of millionaires on the social scene. This was the age of the robber baron, the age of the establishment of the University of Chicago, the age of the great uh, philanthropists. Um, um, but also, you know, as a, these these were these were robber barons, and their um, the um, portraiture of these individuals was decidedly more mixed. Um, oftentimes, what the novelists felt because uh, was be uh, that uh, the, to the extent that people with money had the power to um, transform society. They, um, they were, they, you know, they needed to be, be able to compete with the kind of creative energy um, um, uh, associated with these, uh, with these figures, even as they often vilified them as well. Um, if you move to, in the early part of the progressive era, when um, uh, there was real concern over what um, significant wealth uh, um, was doing um, the uh, you know a book like the jungle which took on the meatpacking industry was also uh, and perhaps more uh, concerned with the you know than with the um, um, uh, the horrible things going on in the meatpacking industry with the enormous power that uh, the meatpacker meatpacking trust and other trusts uh, had on uh, American society and so there was a decided. Um, attack on on uh, uh, extraordinary wealth uh, in the in fiction of that moment, um, and then you move to something like I mean you can move to the Great Gatsby for example, and there you have again you know again a kind of divided view of what you know what possibilities of transformation uh, extraordinary wealth uh, uh, wealth wealth represented. Uh, I could I mean I could go on, but just to leap to the to the um, on, on to the present moment. It's not as if in the novels that I taught in this class, which included John Lanchester's Capital, um, um, uh, Rachel Cusk's Kudos, she, she did a, does a marvelous uh, um, a, a trilogy around this period, which involves in part her, uh, her character, Faye, um, in the second novel, beginning a, a, a home renovation um, as well. But um, there you have her sense that um, it becomes impossible to produce something like character in the novel. Um, and so what you get is a production of, 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 of stories around a, a central character who never quite, quite comes into view, but the um, sort of the shared horizon of the uh, people in her um, novels are people who are sort of our class, um, who do um, interact with those of great uh, wealth, but maybe don't quite, are not all quite uh, you know, among those of great wealth uh, as well. And you could say that everyone in that class or everyone, almost everyone in this novel tends to reveal themselves as lacking in some way, morally lacking or um, lacking in social graces. So that's a kind of um, um, overview to suggest that, uh, you know, the, the portrait of the very wealthy does indeed change um, a bit over the, you know, century or more that, that uh, the, this history of the novel that I've been talking about is an um, is, is an operation. Oh, that's fascinating, Ken. Thank you so much. And um, can I in, or just uh, yes? I, I certainly don't want to get into the uh, the literature world, but uh -huh. and if if one looks at this, you know, a hundred year look, it, if you go back and say, gee, what what caused the Great Depression of uh, not two thousand eight but nineteen twenty nine? The sort of traditional explanation is markets failed, banks failed, 
uh, you know, all of the stuff that goes wrong with market systems and Adam Smith and so forth. Uh, and along comes the guy in the white horse, John Maynard Keynes and Keynesian okay. economics and introduces fiscal policy and if necessary, monetary policy to, to produce stability. Um, would he say that markets would get better all by themselves? Karl Marx would say, of course not. Uh, Bernie Sanders would say, of course not. Uh, but Keynes would say, yes, of course they will get better all by themselves than his famous line. But in the long run, we're all dead. Right. But if you push that a few decades later, Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago, I would argue Milton Friedman and Enrico Fermi are probably the two names most associated with the University of Chicago, where Friedman pretty much, he and his co-author uh, on the monetary history of the United States lay the blame for the Great Depression, the severity and the duration strictly at the doorstep of the Federal Reserve System and just perverse monetary policy. Even on Milton's 90th birthday uh, at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, Ben Bernanke, head of the Fed, turns to Milton and says, you're absolutely right. It was our fault. All I will do is promise you we'll never do it again. Uh, so there are different interpretations. Or why this increase of, of inequality of wealth or income? that sort of took place in the you know, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, uh, it has to do a lot uh, with a lot of complex factors, uh, including human capital. The ratio of wages of college graduates to high school graduates or high school dropouts just accelerates over this period of time. If you're highly skilled in a high-tech world, life is going to be just fine. But if you're not, uh, life is essentially over. Uh. Uh, yes, I, I mean I think that I mean I think you're you're right that there that this is a highly um, um, you know complex uh, a, a topic, and I, I guess the question will always be I mean the, the question coming from the novel right is and, and with respect to what is it that economics describes. Um, because clearly it describes something, and it clearly what it describes um, has a, a real effect. But is it describing, I mean, from the standpoint of the novel, of the history of the novel that Ermarth talks about, is it describing laws that exist outside of, of um, human control that need to be conf conformed to um, or acknowledged? Or is it the justifications for the policies that, various players want to enact that create the outcomes that will inevitably favor one portion of society or 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 another so the 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 argument from the standpoint of the history of the novel the one that gets in some sense overturned as i said in lanchester would be that um economy exists within the domain of human action of the reasons that individuals give groups, interest groups give to support the policies that produce the outcomes that they find favorable, that it's not laws outside of that, that um, um, we need to look to, but to the, you know, the interaction of, of, you know, those with power, those without the broader social uh, view that comes into place. Um, and Lanchester, with that uh, elephant uh, graph that he produced, he actually says that there might be looking at that. I mean, he's very much, um, uh, you know, a critic of of uh, of you know what has happened over the last uh, decade or so. But he says there's also an argument that there might be a moral justification for what you know what that graph shows, which is that although there was stagnation for many of the middle class in the West, that was purchased in some sense by the elevation of a number of people at the bottom end of the curve out of absolute poverty. Um, and, and significant growth in other portions of the population. But what we don't have, he, he uh, suggests, is a kind of moral argument to make to the people who didn't experience growth, why, why their, um, you know, the relative lack of improvement in their lives was part of an overall um, improvement. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if I agree with him on that point, but you can see the scale there. And the question is, you know, do we have the right stories to tell about the outcomes that we're producing? And you know, can we um, persuade those whom we need to persuade that this out this version of the world is better than that version of the world? 
uh, Ken's emphasis, I mean, in the novel, and you're talking about the home, the importance of the home. Um, I, I think of that, if I look at the numbers, it's almost a United States phenomenon. If I look at what percentage is home, home expenses for homes, in, insurance, furniture, whatever, utilities, the United States is so off the scale from any other country on earth, okay? I would say that the home for a European is eh, not all that important. Uh, for the United States, a third in the CPI, Consumer Price Index, a third of the index that goes into making up inflation is homes. If you go into Europe, it's 10%. And it's a third here. And we, we just somehow like to spend money on homes uh, in ways that no other country seems to. If you look again at, at India or China or Europe, they're all around the 8 to 10% range. And we're just sitting there alone at, at a third to 40% of uh, American uh, purchases are uh, our homes. Someone yeah. said that one of the ways in which we can spend so, money, so much money on homes is we spend so little on good clothing. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. that, that the United States has the worst dress affluence the world has ever seen. <laughs> Well, that's fascinating. And I, um, uh, I think this next question follows up on the discussion you've been having. Um, the the uh, questioner says, both speakers are talking about how an extractive economy rewards persons fortunate enough to have bought homes before the crash and the financial teams able to serve them on the rise and profit from foreclosure during the crash. But today, class inequalities seem to be cast in stone and only increase the gaps between the ownership classes and the working poor. So the question is, do we learn from either of your work suggestions how to reverse this trend, which seems to be leading uh, to societal destruction? Well, I mean, uh, the, the brief thing that I would say pertaining to the, um, the graph at the end would be to say, uh, that a, um, a, a policy focusing on rise in real wages for American workers would be the best um, remedy for um, um, entrenched uh, um, um, inequality, that along with, um, um, you know, um, uh, looking at uh, uh, tax rates uh, as well. Alan? Yeah, I would say uh, is... Is inequality rising in the United States? Yes. But to get at why it's rising is a different matter. And also, it's not just in the United States. There is more inequality. Inequality is going up in the U.S. But inequality is also going up in Europe. It's also going up in India. It's going up in China. It's going up across the world. And I think if you think of why is inequality rising worldwide, you come closer to being able to answer the question, be able to provide an effective solution. And as I say, it's largely in the 21st century, if you are unskilled, life is pretty much over uh, because there's such a premium on skill across the world. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, this, this question takes us into a different area, but I think something the audience will, and, and I know I will uh, certainly enjoy. Uh, first, where would you place the bonfires of the vanity by Tom Wolfe? And also um, uh, just in another um, uh, in turn in, in our discussion, any comments on the top films about the financial crisis? For example, uh, The Big Short or Inside Job or Too Big to Fail? Yeah. Um, yeah. The Bonfire of the Vanities. Um, you know, I and I haven't read that book in a long time now. Um, um, I see that really as responsive to something of a different moment um, or a, a different sense of what um, the the nature of the problem was I, I my feeling and I'll, uh, you know and this will be a, I'm, I'm sorry to the questioner I'm sure this will be somewhat uh, um, un, unsatisfactory but I do feel that that 
um, novel um, emerged at a moment where neoliberalism, you know, which was, you know, um, um, was not, had been not um, specifically sort of named among novelists trying to um, uh, produce fictions that were adequate to the, uh, to, to the moment. And I think a lot of the novels that, um, um, you know, uh, the, the ones that I've mentioned, Lanchester, uh, Cusk, uh, and, and the like are novels that come out of a, um, you know, of, you know, of a, of a neoliberal moment. And um, I, I, I did uh, teach in the course that I did uh, the, um, the big short, which I do think is a, um, you know, marvelous, um, um, you know, fictionalization of the event that gives um, the viewer the capacity of this to, to understand what the stakes are. And, and from the standpoint of producing characterization, it also produces the, the, the you know, one feature of this uh, crisis, which is to say that you can't produce a usual kind of um, um, uh, relation between a villain and hero in this, uh, in this novel because they're all um, implicated in uh, you know in, in in the system that has the, that has created the uh, uh, the crisis. Yeah, I, I would certainly add that the, uh, uh, to to what's been said by by Ken and, and the question, uh, the big short inside job margin call uh, too big to fail, Enron the smartest guys in the world, uh, oh. the Queen of Versailles is actually quite good mm -hmm. uh, as a documentary. Um, one movie uh, that my wife and I went up to see in Evanston on a weekend, um, Up in the Air. It's kind of a you know lighthearted. It was nominated as one of the best films of the year. Uh, stars George Clooney. Has a very good cast. Uh, but George Clooney is basically a guy who works for a firm. He goes around the country firing people. This is again during the the, the Great Recession, and. Um, <laughs> We're watching the movie in probably a two-thirds full uh, theater uh, in Evanston, and you could hear a pin drop. It was there were clearly people in the room that they were telling their story, and they had had a visit from George Clooney and and been fired. Um, it was staggeringly important. Um, so it's it's actually produced. Yeah, not that it should matter at all, but some really great films have come out of the 2008-10 uh, period. Let Thank me give you. you one other example here. Interesting. Uh, tomorrow, I use this with my students, but tomorrow at some point, an Air China jet will take off from Shanghai or Beijing. It's a Chinese pilot. It's a Chinese flight crew. It's an Air China jet. Uh, and they fly nonstop to Paris. Once they get over French soil, they have to communicate with the ground tower at Charles de Gaulle Airport to get the plane down, landed in, in Paris. So you've got these Chinese folks and you've got these surly French folks communicating with each other. What language are they speaking? Anyone? English, absolutely. Is it? Oh, I see it. Absolutely. Right. I, is I, it? Even if that plane flies from Shanghai to Beijing, the conversation between the plane and the ground has to be in English. I see. Okay. My own, you know, my again, it's just trivial pursuit or something. I think the 21st century is the first time in human history in which, for all practical purposes, there is only one world language. Good point. That's amazing. And, um, it, and what's causing this, this outsourcing, whether it's to India or wherever else, is not because, say, Indian labor is cheap relative to U.S. labor. Indian labor has always been cheap relative to American labor. It's the phone call is free. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the iPhone. It's the iPad. It's the technology that makes the rest of that transaction basically free. Uh, and uh, it only costs about three cents to get a, a T-shirt made in China to Chicago fr from China. That's nothing. OK, it's just staggering. The, the 21st century technological changes uh, that we've just never witnessed before. Yeah. Thank you. Um, here's a question uh, starts off for Ken. But of course, I think you can both discuss 
Um, the questioner writes, I'm interested in Ken's last point, a recent point, that there have been massive gains for the global poor, and most of the losses have been sustained by the lower classes in the developed world. I think that what's gone unsaid in this chart is China, which has lifted nearly a billion people out of po poverty, largely by supplanting the role played by the lower classes in the developed world. So here's the question. What do you expect the effect of this change to be on the novel and culture more broadly? Will China or communism emerge as the great villain in the 21st century English language literature? Or will that not matter since the consumers of literature are the elites and not the lost lower classes of the developed world? Uh, that's really, really great question. Um, one of the novels that I teach that I haven't mentioned uh, was Arvind Adija's novel, The White Tiger, which was very much influenced by Richard Wright's uh, Native Son, um, and it deal, deals with um, the, a, a member of one of the lowest castes in, um, in India. Um, and it's told as a through a series of letters that he writes in anticipation of a visit by the uh, Chinese uh, premier, I believe, coming to, to India to look into the, uh, the financial prospects within, uh, within India. And, um, and what you have there is, is someone who is experiencing the worst of poverty, um, uh, thinking hard and um, um, and in a very you know uh, I don't want to you know it's hard to talk about novels in certain contexts when people haven't read them because you say you want them to read them you don't want to do spoilers. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in, in some in, you know in some ways I don't really worry about it with my students so much because they're supposed to have read the novel but. Uh, um, and I think it's a really uh, a good novel, but part of part of what is driving that novel is the um, awareness of um, the absolutely um, um, the absolute difference in some sense between the prospects of those who are at the top of the ladder and the prospects of those who are at the uh, at the absolute uh, at the absolute bottom. And so, how do you produce a society? How do you produce behavioral norms that can be shared? when those at the bottom can see and know that no matter what they do, there is no possibility of moving up, uh, moving up the, uh, the ladder. And it's, and it's fascinating when that, within that novel that the axis is between India and China and not say between um, um, India and uh, you know, you know, uh, the, uh, the UK or India and the, uh, um, and the United States. Um, there's another uh, novel, um, is it by Mohsin Hamid, How to Grow uh, Filthy Rich in Rising Asia? And so what we have seen in some sense is the rise of novel, novelists uh, from the subcontinent who are not necessarily working in the domain of the kind of magical realism that um, um, you know, was sort of dominant um, um, maybe, what, 20 years ago, but are now working in genres that, you know, that mimic the sort of self-help how do you rise up out of poverty? What you know? What uh, what means uh, and what possibilities are um, um, you know uh, are, are available uh, uh, for you? Um, I think I answered at least part of the question. Um, yeah. No. Thank you. That's wonderful. And and here's a question uh, aimed at Alan. Um, to what extent is the preoccupation with house value evoked by Lanchester's novel considered a moral hazard? that may have contributed to poor behavior leading up to the Great Recession. Can you give some other examples of moral hazard as well? I guess this is really for both of you, but uh, maybe Alan could begin. Well, certainly um, the, uh, when banks knew they were going to be bailed out, uh, that creates a moral hazard problem. Uh, if we make bad loans and or we make loans, they turn out to be bad loans. As long as we've got the Fed, the Treasury, we've got other financial sectors of the Bush administration, you know, they've got our back. Uh, you can take a lot more risk. Okay? Risk management becomes a, a, a huge issue there. And it was it was a situation where the homeowner and again, I'm not you know, I, I didn't lose a home in the recession myself. Uh, but uh, for people who lost homes, uh, some of it is their own fault. Uh, they were trying to game the system too. They there were 
backups uh, for them. And the federal government is in part responsible. The federal government, uh, again, our community reinvestment acts and other things were designed to help people become homeowners. You know, approximately two thirds of people in the United States own their own home. Um, we're, we're trying to help them, but it meant giving loans, including with no down payments, to people who never, ever should have been considered for a uh, for, for a loan. Uh, so there were again, it was it was the bailouts, the TARP program, everything along the way. The federal government, in in our you know common vernacular, was sort of in bed with the financial industry, with homeowners, with everybody, with every good intention. But the unintended consequences uh, can come back to bite you. Right. Yeah, for me, you know, I'm not, I, I, I guess I look a little askance at the moral hazard um, um, argument in some respects, because, you know, as I, as I was trying to describe uh, what I th think is the really fascinating thing about, among the fascinating things about Lanchester's novel, is the question of how would you figure how to draw the line, which is to say that the entirety of the um, um, you know, market economy that Lanchester lays out is absolutely dependent on um, the idea that you will be able to realize from ownership through the right to sell or to borrow against what it, the price might be, um, you know, the, um, the justification for having the, the property in the first instance as such, mm -hmm. that this is um, not a, a kind of bug in the system. It's a feature of how the system works so that the, um, uh, the line at which you decide something counts as a moral hazard is not given in some direct way by the um, um, the relationships, you know, you know, at what point do you, you, you know, you, you know, you, know, you, you, you venture, you hazard um, a certain amount um, in hopes of, you know, a, great, a, a greater return. You know, those decisions, the decisions about where you draw the line or, or decisions that are um, produced by the, you know, interests and the, um, 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 you know, the feelings and beliefs of people uh, involved. So there's no there's no, you know, and I think Lanchester points out, there's just like no real line here. Um, you know, and you know, what we need is that I go back to the wage thing. And the last thing I'll say, just to get back to the, the question of skill um, and, um, you know, when you're, you know, whether your life is over if you don't have a certain amount of education and the like. I mean, part of the problem in the West is that we accept the idea that, uh, you know, something like the, um, you know, the dead end low wage job. Um, but, you know, um, among the uh, areas where you have significant uh, growth and demand would be something like home health care aides um, who perform an extraordinary task for our society, but who are paid, um, 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 you know, at a criminally low wage. And there's no reason for that other than that's how we value that work. That is to say, you don't need to have a, a college education to do it. It's absolutely necessary given an, a an aging population. Um, we should just pay people more to do it. Great, thank you so much. Um, can you speculate on to, uh, to what extent the literary and historical accounts of the Great Recession of 2008 provide guidance on how best to recover from the current COVID pandemic, global economic and social disruption? So a very pertinent question here. Um, yeah, and I'm going to be really disappointing to whoever asked, <laughs> asked the question, because I, I don't think the literature gives us really uh, um, um, an answer to this. I mean, among the things what literature is trying to do um, to point out in some respects is that we need something other, we need some other standard of value than the market. Um, and the, the, the way in which art can help, help, help us think about that is um, in, in, you know, sometimes on display in these works in which you have um, writers actively trying to think about what is the difference between the novel as a commodity, which you know it is, and the novel as an art form. Um, and, the, um, and, and the way in which those two things are related, but if art's going to count, they have to be distinguishable. And the only way art counts as art in some respects is that it produces the idea of a value that can be not measured in terms of how many books that you, the author sell, sells or um, 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 things, things of that sort. So what art produces in some sense is a desire for some measure other than the market. 
but I don't think art tells us what that thing can be. Um, but that if we can, if we can actually respond to something at the level of, uh, of art, we have an intimation of that other, but I don't think it gives us a path to how to get there. Well, I, ho I hope your novels will be more successful. Uh, novels about COVID will be more successful than the other pieces of this. Uh, and by that, I, I'm not, I'm not proud of a lot of my economist buddies and I'm not implicating the University of Chicago, uh, but just, and I'm, I'm not implicating Trump's advisors or Biden's advisors. They're paid to lie. What I'm, it's people who are at MIT, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, who are not paid to lie. They're paid to do good research uh, and, and, and speak well. And, and there's so much bias going on. A lot of times when, when these people are saying, you know, we're going to follow the science, uh, what they're really saying is we're going to follow the political science. In other words, what gets us in office, <laughs> what keeps us in office, uh, or out of an abundance of caution, which is just a statistical term uh, turned around. Uh, I just think the science in the last year and a half has been disgustingly poor and, and served people very poorly in the country. And so I, I hope uh, your, your buddies will produce the next two or three great novels. <laughs> great. And that I'll be able to buy them on Amazon unless Joe shuts them down. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. I have, uh, there's one comment that I want to read because it uh, speaks to something Alan said earlier. And then I'll have the last question that uh, I think our time is getting, we're drawing close to the end of our time. Uh, so this is not a question, but the uh, uh, quest, uh, the person writing uh, lives, lives in France and says, I wait for trips to the U.S. to buy clothes because they're so much more affordable there. So I thought you would like to hear that. Um, but the last question is is this, um, <clears throat> does the globalization of capitalism fit into this account of the novel and the economy? I refer to the loss of jobs in the US and the rampant buying of properties, even residential homes by foreign buyers. Um, I mean, this, I think uh, now I may have more to say on this than I do, but I do think, yes, um, uh, you know, the, um, the elephant curve uh, graph that I present is presented in terms of global um, globalization. Who, who wins? Who, who loses? From the standpoint of uh, of globalization, and so um, what we have, I think, I mean, this, I mean, you, you can take some of this back to um, um, industrial policy in the U.S. Uh, going back to um, the the 1950s, when um, for for foreign policy reasons, primarily. Um, the United States made, made decisions to allow um, 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 uh, industries like uh, steel to have to compete against um, um, uh, global industries that uh, could um, um, you know, put up trade barriers and, uh, uh, and the like, with the idea that, the, you know, that the, the loss of those good industrial jobs would be offset by growth uh, Growth elsewhere, and that really did not uh, did not play well. Um, and I think politically, we're we are um, um, you know belatedly um, um, you know reaping the, the you know the benefits uh, or the, the, I shouldn't say benefits. I mean, I think the, the consequences, I guess, of of that. So yes, I do think that um, you know the, the you know the the problem is inevitably global. Um, it has, but it is a problem that uh, follows upon policy decisions made at the national level um, and made in terms of calculations about which constituencies it wants, you know, uh, those uh, policymakers want to reward and which constituencies they, they, care, uh, they care less about. Alan, any uh, final thoughts about this? No, no, I'm Ken said it well. Oh, great. Well, this has been a really terrific discussion. Thank you again, Alan and Ken. And thanks to all of you for your questions and thoughts. Very penetrating questions, I thought. Um, I'm grateful for your participation in this salon, and I hope you'll join us again in February when we will hear from philosophy professor Dan Brudney and pediatrician and medical ethicist Dr. Lainey Ross 
about the moral implications of modern medicine. I look forward to seeing you again uh, at that time. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, keep safe, and I hope to see all of you again very soon. Bye-bye.